Hello, and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Monday, April 6th, 2020. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. As the effects of the coronavirus percolate through all our societies, we're going to see a tapering off of research as papers already in the queue for publication all get published, but fewer and fewer papers associated with press releases come out because universities are shut down and not writing the press releases. We're also going to see fewer and fewer papers getting submitted for publication, getting reviewed and published, as people involved in every step are limited in what they can accomplish by these trying times we live in. A lot of people have been talking about how Newton was able to go into seclusion during the Black Plague and come out with heaps of new research accomplished, talking about how it was his most productive time. Well, most of us aren't Newton. Newton was rich. And while Newton had three things, most of us don't. There was no internet connection to distract him with pages of news reports and a myriad of Zoom meetings to fill his day. He got to just like hang out in peace and mostly quiet other than the tolling of the church bells every time someone died. Um, He had a staff. They cooked, they cleaned, they risked their lives finding the stuff needed to get by. He didn't have to do any of that stuff for himself. And um, he also didn't make the same kinds of social connections so many people need. So he wasn't distracted by loneliness or worry for others. Don't be Newton, people. Don't be Newton. While there are folks out there using this time to perfect their hobbies and advance their work, there are also lots of folks sitting on their sofa, binge eating whatever snack food happened to be left on the shelf at the grocery store, while binge watching Tiger King and playing Animal Crossing. If that's what you need to get through your day, that's okay. We aren't all Newton, and we shouldn't be. Some of us notice that We're lying in the gutter looking up at the stars, and the smell of the shit around us just makes it hard to get work done. So, as the news continues to taper out, we're going to work hard to bring scientists on stream to talk about their work. This week, we will have Stuart Robbins joining us tomorrow to talk about his recent work doing a consistent analysis of Mars changing colors. On Thursday, Greg Gabar will join us to talk about gravity, cats, and the intersectional physics of the two. For today, though, it seems like, well, we might as well talk about Uranus. In new research coming out of Tokyo Institute of Technology, researchers have published a model that seems to explain Uranus's bizarre tilt. This seventh planet from the sun is knocked on its side with rotation with its rotational pole sitting in the plane of the planets and periodically pointing at the sun. This is not normal. This is not how planets form. To get into this weird inclination, something had to happen to Uranus. Since this pale blue planet is, well, a swirling mass of gas, we can't directly see scars left by impacts the same way we can on solid worlds like the moon or Mars. What Uranus has instead are a set of icy rings and icy moons, well, and a weirdo tilt. In a new model, scientists led by Sagiro Ida describe how a collision between young Uranus and a massive ice world could have both tipped Uranus over and also formed its rings and its 27 moons in the process. The colliding body would have needed to be one to three Earth masses in size, which is larger than any icy body so far found, but is consistent with the kind of world we expect to find on the edge of the Kuiper belt as planet nine. While this collision process is similar in many ways to how our own moon was formed, it was also, well, 
different in some very meaningful ways. And I apologize for the dogs upstairs. My neighbors are trying to sell their house and have a gardener gardening who likes to be in our driveway while he gardens their yard and the dogs take offense. I am very sorry. I am sorry, Twitch. I am star sorry, YouTube. There's going to be dogs barking. All right. So the, the collision between this one to three earth mass, icy body and Uranus and our own world's collision with a rocky Mars sized world that led to the formation of our moon. These two processes were similar in terms of, well, a whole lot of energy was released and moons were part of the result. But with Uranus, it would have been very different for the very simple reason that ice melts. I mean, rock does too, but rock then cools off and forms rocks rather rapidly. The ice that vaporized around Uranus, well, it essentially formed snow over time. It was vaporous and gassy for a long time. And a lot of it ended up having more of a chance to drift in and become part of, well, Uranus. And what was left behind this massive world? It formed those rings. It formed those 27 moons, but it formed them so far apart that they never had the chance our own moon had to come back together into a single giant object. Now, this team came to these conclusions while working on trying to model how worlds have formed in a myriad of ways around so many of the planets in our solar system, from trying to understand the formation of the moons of Ganymede, Titan, Callisto, Io, the Galilean moons around Jupiter, to understanding, well, the stolen moons, the small rocky asteroids and Kuiper Belt objects like Triton at Neptune and try and understand our own moon. Using their computer models, they realized it was a model for collision that best explained everything that we see at Uranus. This is pretty cool research, and um, it may finally answer the question of how do you get a world like Uranus? All right, that's all I have got for today. Um, and, um, I just like to remind you that as part of keeping us all occupied in these really weird times, we're going to be trying to host a lot more additional content on Twitch. This is part of where all of the interviews we're doing come from. And we want to remind you that CosmoQuest has an active community on Discord where you can talk science and even just find other people to join you in playing some online games. You can find links to everything that is going on at CosmoQuest.org. Thank you all for being here. Today's script was written by me, Dr. Pamela Gay, and The Daily Space is produced by Susie Murph. We are a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you. The best way you can support us is through patreon.com slash cosmoquestx like us? Please share us. You never know whose life you can change by adding a daily dose of science. Thank you. All right, I will now take your questions and I ask you to please use the purple circle with the purple star in the center to make it a little bit easier for me to find them. All right, let's see what all we've got. And I would like to thank Admiral Blue Bear for the follow um, and thank Crispy Fried Man for your sub for 16 months in a row. That is absolutely amazing. And Nutty, thank you so much for the host over. All right, let's see what we have. Um... Apologies for missing um, a co morning coffee this morning. Um, as some of you on the Discord know, yesterday I made mistakes. Um, I was outside gardening first thing in the morning. I then came inside. Well, no, actually I started my day by posting a ton of stuff to Etsy where I have a shop that is 739 Studios where I sell planets I paint. I paint planets. 
this one is determined to blue screen. Um, and actually, I have big ones right next to me. So yesterday, I was taking photos of, of planets I paint and posting them on Etsy, where you can buy them. Um, and then as soon as I was done doing that, I went outside and I gardened. And um, as soon as my husband was tired of gardening, I came inside and I worked on cleaning the basement because we need to get our woodworking sharp shop going and we need to get our garden so that we can plant things. And, and after I was done with all of that, I ate dinner, which meant that I sat still. And, and while sitting still, my entire body froze up into a mass of thou shalt never move again ever. And I went to bed early, but it turned out like my hands hurt so much that every time I tried to steal back the sheets, I woke myself up because my hands hurt. And so I simply completely failed to wake up this morning in a timely manner. And at 940, I, I realized, oh, shoot, that is no longer the news on the radio. Um, apparently, my alarm went off, turned on the radio, listened to the news for a few minutes, totally went back to sleep. Um, so yeah, I, um, I overdid yesterday. I'm sorry. I will try to be back tomorrow. Um, thank you so much space herpes for the follow. Thank you. Things I never thought I would say. Anyways, I'm sorry I missed morning coffee on so many different levels. Um, I'm only on my second cup of coffee and I'm still drinking. DPI, you don't need to cut to count your cups of coffee unless you need to ration for some reason. Um, yeah. I know I shouldn't exceed three cups of coffee in one day or I become a crazy person. By which I mean I simply am bouncing off walls. I'm one of those people. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, Broken Symmetry has an owl eating a bagel as an emote. I love that emote. I want a snow owl that eats bagels. I really do. Hello, Michael. Um. <laughs> it's the sea foam planet that is knocked on its side. This is true. This is true. Call it George, Larry says. Um, I'm not going to call it George. That was one of its original prepared names. For me, George is is reserved for Bugs Bunny. Um, let's see. Not a lot of questions today, but not a lot of things to ask questions about. Astrowise, I too relate to Uranus. I too relate to its crazy tilt. Oh, I am often crazily tilted. Hey, Myth Town. Dog opinions are noted. Yes. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So, so Bit Monkey asks. This is on YouTube. So we do archive everything to YouTube because there are people who can't. Um, get to Twitch based on the country that they're in. And there are people who don't want to come to Twitch because people. Um, so we want to get this content out to as many people as possible. So it gets archived over on YouTube. You can always catch it here, both live and voice video on demand, though. Hello, Svartmaya. Oh, the dogs are truly having no none of it. I can still hear the leaf blower the neighbors are using. I don't blame the dogs. At least the leaf blower seems to, by the sound of it, indicate they are on the other side of their yard now. Um, let's see. Hello, fellow hoodlum. Hello, Gillian. Jillian. Hello, Jillian Georgine. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Um, hello, refs, Matt. Hello, Hanny's Warfer. How do you solve a problem like Uranus? Um, yeah, I yes, that is something that I now I'm going to have as a brain worm in my head. Um, 
Not a lot of questions. There, Astrowive asks, on the image of Uranus, um, what are those three red spots? So this is a thermal image. Those are just three different storms where they're pulling heat from the lower levels up towards the surface. It's just like hurricanes um, appear significantly warmer in radar images, not in radar, in thermal images here on Earth. Um, so those are just storms. I too saw that image and became excited by the three pink splotches thinking, ooh, was it impacted? And I did not know. No, nothing exciting, just storms. Um, so Michael asks, are people still publishing papers on archive? Yes. But like with everything, it's all slowing down. People just are having trouble peopling right now. And that's okay. Um, so as the press releases dry up, we're going to bring on people whose brand new papers I've seen or they've talked about um, that may not have press releases. And I'm going to let them talk about their own research. And um, we're going to find ways to make it all work. Trucker Kev, yes, gardening hurts. Gardening hurts so much. It really hurts. I also made a fatal mistake yesterday. I did not know that stinging nettles grew here. Um, and I reached down to grab a weed and it turned out to be a stinging nettle. And like my hand is still swollen from the experience. <sighs> um, yeah. Such, such a sadness. Jillian Georgine says, I was just reflecting that astronomy timelines are such that it can handle a delay in experiments and observations. Though for us impatient humans, it means waiting longer for answers. But there are time-sensitive projects. Um, but are there time-sensitive projects that are suffering because of the situation? I think the things that most of us are worried about are the Vera Rubin... Um, Lander, no, sorry, the Russell and Franklin lander um, that ESA was going to send to Mars, which I think has been officially delayed. I need to double check that. And while NASA is saying that the Perseverance rover, um, formerly the Mars 2020 rover, won't be delayed, I think a lot of us are less convinced than the current press releases seem to be asking us to be convinced. Um, so basically, launch windows wait for no one. And if we miss a launch window, we have to wait a couple of years for Mars. It gets trickier with other spacecraft. Um, I want to say that Europa Clipper, which is destined in theory to launch on a Space Launch Systems rocket, is the one we need to worry about most. Space Launch Systems was already greatly delayed. And while they can launch to Europa on a different rocket, um, there isn't a rocket out there that will get it to Europa as fast as the still theoretical or vaporware, I guess, the still vaporware Space Launch Systems can get it to um, Europa. So beyond that, we can just sort of plug along. Our science is good that way. It gets annoying when you miss observing windows, which are different from launch windows. So I used to, um, and I want to go back to this project eventually, um, there's a variable star by the name of AH Leo that is super annoying because it's only in the sky for a few months each year. Um, at night and it is a double period Aurelari star. It has its regular up and down beautiful light curve but the amplitude of that light curve gets modulated by what's called the Blazko effect and we're still coming to terms with what the Blazko effect is and with this particular star the duration of its Blazko effect is more or less the same amount of time as this object is annoyingly in the sky so you need multiple years of observations to make sense of it and stars can like skip cycles and things like that which just makes a mess of all of it so if you have that kind of a super annoying object that you're trying to observe missing an observing season can be the death of you um, emotionally your science will continue it will it really will you will just be annoyed and want to throw things but there's lots of reasons right now to be annoyed and want to throw things 
Uh, let's see what else is in here. Yeah, DPI. I usually have three cups as well. I just know I need to then switch over to tea. Um, oh, no. Fenmil had technological issues. Hanny's Vorverb writes, if this all goes Mad Max, coffee could become a currency. That's going to happen in the future anyways. With the current climate models, um, coffee is getting harder and harder and harder to grow, and there aren't new places that have the correct combination of altitude, landscape, humidity, sunlight that are getting warmed to the point that coffee needs. So... <laughs> Enjoy coffee while you can. The next generation, it's going to suck for them. Um, Keeper wants a bagel. I too want a bagel. Uh, Paranor says, I have three cans of coffee in reserve. So I buy coffee in recyclable bags from public goods. And I have to say their coffee is far better than I would have imagined for generic coffee. Um, and it comes in recyclable bags. And I have four bags of coffee right now because it's mail order. So I always buy four bags. And then when I get down to one, I order four more. Um, hello, Wayne Johnson. So Hanny asks, um, how much gravity do astronauts feel when returning to Earth? Are the are they weightless until they get close? So the the issue with astronauts on their way down is um, they're decelerating, and the amount of gravity that we feel that's a force on our bodies, and another way to feel a force is to be accelerated or decelerated. So. As they're falling through the atmosphere, trying to shed orbital velocity, that's one heck of a force on the body. So pretty much as soon as they start transforming their motion around the planet from a nice happy orbit to a, oh my goodness, we're going to hit the surface, trajectory downwards, they start feeling forces. And these are forces caused by motion, not by the Earth's gravity. Um, I hope that made sense. Uh, Admiral Blue Bear, I like your name. Admiral Blue Bear asks, um, any news on Planet Nine? I've read a paper that there might not be a Planet Nine, but rather a primordial black hole in the outskirts of the solar system. There is not a primordial black hole in the outskirts of the solar system unless um, physics went extraordinarily sideways. I, as far as we know, black holes evaporate. And so primordial black holes shouldn't be around. Uh, that said, if there was a primordial black hole out there, it probably would be gravitationally lensing background objects periodically, and we'd catch those flares and be confused. Um, so there's lots of different reasons to not think there's a primordial black hole. Um, Michael Brown and his team are continuing to chew their way through the sky looking for planet nine um in all likelihood we need to wait for the vera rubin observatory to open and thank you lonely rains for the follow thank you um when when the vera rubin observatory opens its large synoptic survey telescope will be able to observe the entire visible sky down to 20th magnitude every four nights and by doing this in this constant repeating four night four night four night cycle they will be able to find all the things that are moving and faint. Um, nominally part of their mission as a ground-based telescope, because you can still have a, a um, mission statement, even if you're stuck to the planet. Um, part of their mission is to find all the asteroids that might be hitting, might be tempted to hit the Earth. But along the way, they're going to turn up planets near star, Kuiper belt objects, all sorts of different things through a variety of different methods, including potentially Planet Nine. So I suspect that um, within a year of its commission, if there is a Planet Nine visible from the Southern Hemisphere, it's going to find it. It's um, If it's a Northern Hemisphere object that I worry. 
Secura Cube, thank you also for the follow. Thank you so much. All right, so let's see what else we've got in here. Um, yeah, let's all hope Planet Nine is a Southern Hemisphere object, because if it's Northern Hemisphere, I don't know when we're going to find it. I'm going to move my teleprompter screen, because it keeps trying to, like, convince me to say things that I've already said. Um, let's see what else is in here. Hanny's Vorverp comments, scientists whose work is seasonal are missing their windows, I suppose. This is true, but the primary window that we worry about is summer in the Antarctic. And since coronavirus hit after they were already all deployed to Antarctica, those folks are probably in the best place they can possibly be because there's no coronavirus in Antarctica so far. I'm not sure they're going to want to come home, um, but those were really the ones that we needed to worry about. And there is, as Larry points out, so much of a backlog of data Henny comments, nettles are better than fire ants. I'm not entirely sure because nettles, um, you can like get stuff embedded in your skin that just doesn't come out. So my hand finally stopped hurting from the nettles um, only while I was asleep. Fire ants in the moment are like, oh my goodness, going to die. Um, but then once you're no longer being bit, you're usually fine rather quickly. Um, I once scared the bejesus out of a horse because I um, took my horse to a watering trough because you can take a horse to a trough. It, however, did not drink because while it was spilling the water, it turned out I was standing on a fire ant mound and I jumped into the water trough. Um, the horse never drank out of that water trough after that. <sighs> Let's see what else. Um, so crispy fried man, there's so many different things that can get turned into tea that I suspect that we will always have something that we can use to make a tea. Yeah, chocolate is also having problems astro wise. We will run out of chocolate and coffee. <sighs> and you will be able to plant wine in the Scottish Highlands. Good wines are coming from more and more northerly locations. Um, mm, Guido, yeah, makes a good point on the toilet paper as currency. Currently a thing, currently a thing. <laughs> the days will be the wave of the future. Um, let's see what else. It is cold down here, I would like to point out. Yeah, Larry, my favorite two beans are also in danger. Garbanzos do appear to be safe, so we're good for all of our chickpea recipes. I'm looking for more questions. Um, Jillian asks, um, is the moon at Apogee? I don't know. <laughs> Can it be a bad month for werewolves since we're all having such a great year as it is? Yeah, I, I don't know. Pink supermoon. So it is at Apogee Keeper? Um... Corona Sandwich says, lost for life. I don't know quite what you're talking about, so I'm just going to be confused. confused. Um, <laughs> you plant grapes, not wine. This is true. This is true. You do plant grapes, but um, grapes do eventually turn into wine if you do the right things to them. Jost. Okay. That makes more sense, maybe. Um, ah, a Nova Scotia wine. Thank you. Thank you.
hummus is a truly fabulous, fabulous thing. All right. So we have now wandered in all sorts of random directions with this chat. Um, it's probably time for me to wind this up and finish writing things up so that I can record the podcast for Susie. And oh my God, I have so many meetings today. So many meetings. Zoom. Zoom is going to kill me. I had no meetings until bored extroverts started creating them. <sighs> okay. May you all have a wonderful day out there or evening or afternoon. Um, as we wind up this show, I just want to remind all of you that today's episode was written by me, Dr. Pamela Gay, and this episode will be produced by Susie Murph. We are a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring um, this solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you, your bits, your subs, your patronage at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX, as well as all your volunteer efforts. All these ways that you can and do help keeps going. Thank you. For now, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. I'll see you on the other side.